This is a brief introduction to inductors. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what they are, why they're important, how they work, and some applications for them. Finally, I'm going to show you how to calculate the inductance of a coil of wire. So let's get started. You might ask, well, what is an inductor? An inductor is simply a coil of wire. That means that every coil of wire is an inductor, whether you like it or not. Sometimes we build inductors intentionally and use them in our circuits for some of their properties. But other times we have coils of wire in electronic devices and they act like inductors, even though we might not want them to. This is true, especially in electric motors. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So you might ask, well, why are inductors important? If it's just a coil of wire, why do we care about that? Well, the most important factor about inductors is that they allow low frequency signals to pass through them, but they block out high frequencies. And this can be very useful in a number of applications. In order to understand how inductors work, we have to understand what happens when current flows through a wire. Imagine that you have a single wire and you push a little bit of electricity through it. This electricity moving through the wire creates a magnetic field around that wire. So electricity going through wire creates magnetism. It turns out that the reverse is true as well. A changing magnetic field will create electricity in a wire. So if you had a second wire lying next to your first one, and that second wire experienced the magnetic field from the first one, that would cause a current to flow through the second wire. This current would in turn create its own magnetic field. And if there was another wire lying next to your first two, it would experience the field from the second wire, which would create a current in the third wire, which would create another magnetic field, and so on. So if you had more wires lying parallel, they would undergo the same phenomena. So what this means is that when electricity starts moving through one wire and there are parallel wires lying next to it, the electricity moving through the first wire essentially has to drag along the electricity in the second wire. And so if you just have two wires lying next to each other, it's harder to get electricity to move through um, the first wire than it would be if that first wire was by itself because when you have two wires that that electricity moving through the first one has to drag along the electricity in the second wire and by the same token if you have three wires and you try and get the electricity moving through the first one it has to drag along the electricity in the second one and the third one and if you have more wires it has to drag along that electricity too so the more wires you have lying next to each other the harder it is to get the electricity moving through any one of them because in order to get it moving, you have to get the electricity moving through all of the others at the same time. Now, by the same token, when the electricity is moving, it's hard to get it to stop because if you try to make it stop, it's kind of getting pulled along by the electricity that's moving next to it. So in other words, it's hard to get the electricity to start moving and once it's going, it's hard to make it stop again. So far, we've been talking about wires lying next to each other, but it turns out that a coil behaves just like many single wires lying side by side. So just like with the single wires, it's hard to get electricity to start flowing through a coil. And once the current is flowing, it's hard to make it stop. So this is why in inductors, low frequencies pass through the inductors easily, but high frequencies get blocked out. Low frequencies have a lot of time to change, so they have a lot of time to allow the current to start moving, and then they have a long time to allow the current to stop, so they, they pass through relatively easily. But high frequency signals are trying to start and stop and start and stop and start and stop really fast, and we have seen that um, inductors are resistant to changes in current. So high frequency signals just don't get through inductors very well. So that's why inductors allow low frequency signals to pass through 
but they block out high frequencies. So you might ask, well, what are inductors used for? One of the main applications for inductors is filter circuits. For example, this is a low pass filter. It allows low frequencies to go through, but it blocks out high frequencies. The way that it works is that an input signal is connected on the left, and if it's a low frequency signal, it passes through that inductor relatively easily, and it gets to the output on the right. A high frequency signal gets blocked by that inductor and cannot make it through. This is a high pass filter. Um, high frequency signals get through this filter, but uh, low frequency signals are blocked out. The way that it works is that um, a, if a low frequency signal is attached on the left hand side, then it goes through the capacitor, but it also goes through the inductor and it goes to ground. So low frequency signals go to ground in a high pass filter, whereas high frequency signals can't go through the inductor to ground, so they go to the output instead. So high frequency signals go through, but low frequency signals are um, absorbed by ground. Another use for inductors is in something called a tank circuit. This is a circuit that resonates at a particular frequency. It's used frequently in uh, radio applications. Automotive coils are another example where inductors are used. Here, the idea is to create a high voltage in order to create a spark inside of a spark plug to ignite gasoline inside the engine. So we need a high voltage, but we only have a low voltage car battery to start with. So what we do is we use an inductor to create that high voltage. The way that it works is that um, a switch is closed initially and current starts to flow from the battery through the inductor and back to the battery. And after that current has had time to settle down, the switch is opened. And we know that inductors like the current to keep moving once it's going. But when that switch is opened, the current can no longer come from the battery, so it has to come from somewhere else. So the inductor pulls all of the electrical charges from one side of it and feeds them all the way to the other side. That creates a very high voltage difference from one side of the inductor to the other. And when that voltage gets high enough, a spark occurs from one side of the spark plug to the other, and that spark ignites the fuel inside of your piston. And that's what makes the piston move. So that's how automotive coils work. Inductors are also found inside of electric motors. Now this is one of those places where we might not want something to behave like uh, an inductor, but we have a coil of wire and all coils are inductors whether we like it or not. So we just saw that um, when, you, when you suddenly disconnect electricity from a coil, it creates a very high voltage from one side of that coil to the other. And we saw that in an automotive engine, that's exactly what we want. But in an electric motor, we're doing the same thing, so we get the same result. We're, we're often um, powering and, and disconnecting the electricity from these coils um, quite a bit. And when we do that, it creates the same high voltage that we saw inside of the automotive coil for the same reason. So we're getting these high voltages inside of this electric motor, and sometimes that's a bad thing. It can, high voltages can damage electric circuits that are connected to these motors if we don't deal with them appropriately. So we need to understand that um, these voltages are occurring so that we can handle them. Now that we've seen some uses for inductors and some of the consequences of having inductors where we don't want them, you might want to know how to figure out how much inductance a coil of wire has so you can tell how much it's going to affect your circuit. So this is a formula that you can use to calculate the inductance of a coil. The formula says that the inductance is n squared times a divided by little l, all multiplied by some constants, where n is the number of turns in your coil, a is the cross-sectional area, and l 
is the length of your coil. So we can see that in this equation, the number of turns plays the most important role because that gets squared. Um, and then um, the, the cross-sectional area is there. So if you have a bigger cross-sectional area, you're going to end up with more inductance. Now, the um, inductance is divided by the length of your coil. So to kind of understand what's happening there, imagine that you have two coils that each have 10 turns in them. One is an inch long and the other one is two inches long. Right? They've got the same number of turns, but one of them, um, the turns are, are much closer together. So when the, the coils of wire, when the wires are, are closer to each other, they're going to have a greater effect on each other. So they're going to have more inductance. So the longer your coil is, the more spacing you're going to have. So the less inductance you're going to end up with. So that's why the length actually decreases the inductance. So now we've learned a little bit about inductors. Let's review a few of the things that we've discussed. So an inductor is just a coil of wire and every coil of wire is an inductor, whether you like it or not. Low frequency signals pass through inductors, but high frequency signals are absorbed by them. Inductors can be used in filters, tank circuits, coils, motors, and many other applications as well. And finally, the inductance of a coil of wire can be calculated with the formula n squared times a divided by little l, um, all multiplied by some constants. So that's a brief introduction to inductors. I hope you've learned something useful.